the topic I was given, or that I chose a little bit myself, is disasters. Now, can I ask you by showing up, which of you has really seen in the operating room a disaster? Show up. Show up hands. Who really has seen a disaster? Okay, to, uh, just be honest. It could be anything. So there are like four or five of you. Maybe some of you don't want to tell. But uh, matter of fact is there are disasters. And uh, they are funny now, afterwards. But during, when it happens, they are not that funny. Now, I've been in urology long enough. I started my residency uh, the late in the 90s. Uh, uh, I finished medical school in 91. So uh, for me, it, it is very interesting that when I go back to history and look what the disasters I had, um, there are some interesting cases, but I cannot tell you all of them. So I pick two, and then I give you, I'm going to show you six videos of complications. I think this is the best thing I can do today in the amount of time I have. Now, we are in the EIU in a panel of complications, together with uh, Dr. Stenzel, Dr. Adibani, Dr. Pansadoro, and Perandas Abrahamson, where we try to discuss complications and disasters, how to manage them, and how, what do they look like. Because one of the biggest problems of disasters is you don't recognize them when they happen. So you leave them alone, you continue your case, and the problem comes later. So the first thing I would like to start is with kidney surgery. And I would like you to, to participate, so I want to hear answers. Here we have a female patient, age, age 57, who had hysterectomy before, had nexectomy for cystic lesions, and had an appendectomy. She comes for a roughly three centimeter tumor in the kidney on MRI. Now this patient, here is a tumor, I think you can, maybe we can uh, zoom, dim the lights of the room so there is less uh, flashing uh, on this. You see, everybody sees the tumor? I think it's a no-brainer, everybody sees the tumor. It's a roughly classical tumor to do a, what would you do with this patient? A, partial nephrectomy. Cystectomy, no. Partial nephrectomy. Radical prostatectomy, good idea. Nephrectomy, complete nephrectomy. Okay, well, guess what? We are not as good as you are. We do partial nephrectomies in these cases because removing the whole kidney, I may end up with her lawyer. So the idea is to remove only the tumor. But good answer, actually. Why would you say nephrectomy? Okay, now we're getting closer. What is it you don't like? It's? Oh, this guy's good. Did you work with us in Vienna? I didn't notice you. Okay. Well, this is, is what it's a, it's a pretty central tumor. But you know, uh, urologists and surgeons are vain. You know what vain means? They think they can do it better and, and nicer. So you always are intrigued to do a little bit more and not a little bit less. Now, we decided to do a partial nephrectomy on this case. And uh, we discussed it. So basically what we recommended uh, to do a partial nephrectomy. Of course, you're saying it's a central tumor, you do total nephrectomy. It's a fair assumption. It's not wrong to do it. But if you go to the guidelines recommendation, this would go for a partial nephrectomy. I think we can be very clear on that. So we did a laparoscopic kidney resection of the tumor. Everything went well. We did it transperitoneally. We don't do retrops. Uh, uh, operations, we use five ports. The healer anatomy was kind of difficult because the, the branching of the artery was very inside uh, the tumor, tending towards the tumor. And he had a lot of branches of the arteries. And the main artery also was branched in three. So he had a lot of branching and branching and sub-branching. The tumor was only partially exophytic, as you all correctly said, so it was already difficult to see it, although on MRI it looked very nice, but when we looked at it from outside, we didn't see the tumor macroscopically well. This happens. And you can see here very nice, you know, you see it, it looks like a lump, but before we made the incision, it looked like a lower kidney. Lower, he had the same lump on the other side of the kidney, so it was kind of tricky. But we finally identified. You see, if you look on the left picture, you can barely identify the tumor. But uh, anyways, we, we got it. And um, sorry, we used bulldog clamps. So the way we do partial nephrectomy, we only clamp the artery. Uh, some people also clamp the vein. Uh, they do first the artery and then the vein. We never clamp the vein 
because we would like some backflow of blood. Uh, so uh, we clamped the artery. We did the resection of the tumor. Um, no perforation was seen, at least. And ischemia time was roughly 20 minutes, a little bit less than that. No signs of any calicial problems, as you suggested correctly. Um, nevertheless, uh, we, we kind of like, you know, sutured it with double S and, and, and um, you know, put, we normally put a little bunch on it, uh, you'll see in a minute, but uh, blood loss was 300 ml, so everything was okay. Um, and then we just covered the area, you know, we took out the tumor, and this was the histology, it was RCC, grade one, PTA, PT1A, whatever. I mean, again, to go back with you, for with this histology, having done a radical nephrectomy, I would have been in trouble with the patient. You agree with that, right? It's a little bit overkill. Okay, so this was all good, and I was happy. And uh, no early complication, no bleeding, no, you know, everything was good. But suddenly, we were sending the patient home, really, on day four. We, she was a woman, she was a little bit achy, uh, itchy, we didn't send her home on day two or three, we sent her home on day four. Suddenly, when we were about to remove the drain, which funny enough, we sometimes don't put a drain even, but we did put, don't ask me why, it was, it was uh, God's inf inf influence on that one. We suddenly have a, had a rise in the drainage, about 300 ml in 24 hours, and it looked urinish. So we did the biochemistry of that, and it came back creatinine very high, urea very high, standard problem. So you have urine there. Go back to you. What, what is it probably? Fistulation from the calyx or from the pelvis. Right. So this is what we thought. Now, we did a retrograde, of course. You have to do that. No discussion. Um, some people don't do it and just put, but we do it, and you see that there is exterization. What would you do? Excuse me? Double J stand. Bingo. So that's what we did. We put him a double J stand. Uh, sorry. Where is that? Yeah, here. So we put a double pigtail insertion. Uh, we had immediately decrease of urine secretion. So the pigtail worked. Urine from the drainage came. We left the drainage inside. No, nothing came out. Uh, and we did biochemistry. Uh, it was still high urea, creatinine, and potassium. So there was still some drainage. Okay. So there's also one thing, if it doesn't go down to zero immediately, you should think about it. There is something wrong. But anyways, we did not anticipate something being wrong. We were happy it's going down. We left it in, of course, until the drainage stops draining, right? You have to leave the pigtail until the drain brings nothing. Suddenly on day 11, uh, the pigtail was blocked with the blood clot and we had persistent urinary drainage. So the urine drainage went up again because for some reason the pigtail was blocked. Why is the pigtail blocked? Because you did tumor excision, so there must be some blood there, right? So the pigtail was blocked, so we had to change the pigtail and we noticed it because urine came out again from the drain. So the drain went up again, the urine. So whenever the drainage goes up and you have a pigtail, the pigtail is either displaced or it's blocked. So what do you do now? Quickly, guys. Please, another pigtail. Well, we do that. Um, oh, this, is, God, this is going too fast. So, here. So we put a double uh, pigtail again, but we put it where the exterization was. And um, so we put it in the upper calyx, because before it was in the pelvis. And now we literally put it in the upper calyx where the exterization was. Strict bed rest, and on 13th day, we had to reposition the pigtail because it moved on x-ray. Uh, but basically, she did well. On, post, on the 14th post-operative day, no leakage. 18th day, we removed the stent, no more bed rest, and she was discharged on day 20 with no problems. Now, simple case, but still, what do you think we should have done differently? You think it was the suction from the drainage that made this happen? Well, I, on, uh, the normal bleeding drain, you mean? Or which one? The, the, the pigtail? Well, yeah, so we, we don't do that. We leave it, if there is something coming out, we leave it. And because she was going home on day four, um, 
don't bug me on that. Sometimes the, the residents forget it. Um, we said remove it. It was in the evening. Maybe he did it in the morning. But something happened, obviously, on that night shift that they felt, let's leave it inside and wait for me in the morning. So, because it was probably draining too much. And if it drains, you cannot remove a stent that brings 100, 120 ml suddenly, right? Before it was nothing. So, removing it early removes maybe the Van der Waalsche force, you know, this, this suction force that a drain does. You do that in radical prostatectomy. When you put a drain too close to the anastomosis, you will have urine in it because it will suck the urine. So you put the drain back a little bit. Whenever you have too much urine coming out of the drain after radical prostatectomy, just pull the drain back a little bit, two centimeters. That's enough. You don't be worried about the, the, the anastomosis because it's always going to be not water tight if you do it in intermittent sutures. But in this case, honestly, I think this was the right thing. Retrospectively, what we would have done differently, and I don't know how you guys would have done it, we, would, we should have put the pigtail right away in the upper calyx. And so my message is for complication after tumor, whenever you position the pigtail, don't do it like James Bond, just put it in and go home. Look where the, the, the problem is and put the pigtail as cr close as possible to that place where the, 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 the problem is. So this is one thing. Any comments? Larger pigtail, good, good idea. It's a thicker one. This was seven French pigtail. You put eight French. We have seven, so we can put the eight French. Probably is a little bit better. But I think the most important, do you agree that putting it in the right position, so just putting it in the pelvis is not enough because you still will have drainage up there. Okay. Well, next case is my favorite case is radical prostatectomy. So here, 70-year-old man. By the way, these guys, you can, if you come to Vienna, you can, I can show you the chart of this patient. It's not a made-up case. It's real cases. 70-year-old guy, he had diabetes, called a cystectomy. He had a TUR 2007 for BPH. Um, and at that time, it was an incidental prostate cancer, PT, CT1A, so six. Gleason score, you do active surveillance, right? At that time, he was younger, but for, for less than 5% of TUR chips, T1A, you don't do radical prostatectomy. So we opted for active surveillance with him. He had rebiopsies, and in the course of his rebiopsies, he had uh, a Gleason 7. So, of course, what would you do now? Any options? You continue, who continues active surveillance? Three plus four, four plus. It's 3 plus 4. In 7 out of 12, so more than 50% of the cores. So who would go active surveillance? Who would go radiotherapy? Who would go surgery? Surgery. Guys, some of you don't do anything. Well, are you dermatologists? I mean, <laughs> come on. Or gynecologists, those are the great surgeons. Surgery. Nobody shows up, so who would do surgery in this case? Okay, some don't do anything. Well, you like active surveillance. So here you go, we, do, we want you agree with surgery all? Okay, so we, that's what we did. We did a robotic radical prostatectomy. It was one of the first cases we did where we were not that good with it. We had a small rectal lesion during the operation. Okay, it was very small. And Bernardo Rocco was in Vienna at that time, so we did it together. And we saw it during the operation. We saw the lesion. So what do you do when you do a case and you have a lesion? What would you do? Closure, 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 immediate closure. Uh, since it's an endoscopic procedure, would you open him? Anybody would open him to do that closure? No, you stay where it is because that's also a no-brainer, making a sutures. Important is we do it two layers, always two layers after rectums. When you call the general surgeon to do it, he would probably do a one layer because they're always cool. But we are not because he's our patient, so we do a two layer. And this is important. Okay, so that's what we did. Waterproof, monocryl, uh, suture. So what do you do at this point? You finish the case. Would you still do a colostomy? No. Uh, would you put a rectal drainage? Anything inside? No. Antibiotics, yes. yes. Nutrition. You do it normally or you do it with any anastomosis in the bowel. You would wait three, four days. You know, our surgeons start giving food the next day after anastomosis already. So they start very early with food. Well, they don't give him a schnitzel, but they give him soup and stuff like that. But again, message is, even if our surgeons push towards early 
food, don't do it. I always have listened to them, and after I'm now 51 this year, uh, I don't do it anymore. I don't do listen to them. I wait. Unfortunately, this guy got food the, ne the second day after this closure. He got food immediately, just to tell you. What about the catheter? Would you re leave it in as long as you do it for normal radical prostatectomies, once you have a rectal lesion, or remove it later or earlier? Depending on drainage. Depending on drainage? Same. So you, you wouldn't change, as if you have done a normal radical prostatectomy. Okay. So uh, on the ninth day, on the ninth day, so we normally remove it on the seventh, eighth day after radical process. I'm honest with you. On the ninth day, you had permanent catheter extraction. We removed the catheter. He had a little bit of incontinence, not much. Pathology came back, Gleason 6, PT2C. So it was not, it was not a 7. There was a downgrading of this case. Um, what we didn't like is that the patient wasn't doing that well. And uh, he went home, but came back on day 11 to the clinic and said he cannot pee. He was in retention. Um, and suddenly he had also urine coming out of his rectum, secretion. Initially, we thought it's normal rectal secretion. It's nothing to worry about. Uh, so we put back in a, ca a catheter. Uh, we did anoscopy and saw a 15 millimeter lesion again so basically, the suture was open that we did. So that we called the surgeon in the same day, and they came in, cool as they always are, and did immediately a transanal closure. Now, this was many years ago. Since that time, I never do this again. So it was a lesson for me. Number one, in German, we say Wurstelkirurg. You know, it's like ham surgeon. You know, they do it like, as if this was like cool. Uh, he took, of course, transanally a needle and did this. Now, guess what happened? The anastomosis is right behind his suture, right? He doesn't know what anastomosis is, the surgeon, so. But anyways, he did it, and uh, at that time, I was happy. Super, he did it, wonderful, wonderful. What would you do at this point, by the way? The, the, it went up again. It opened. So what would you do? You do a transanal closure, okay? Would you put a colostomy in now? <clears throat> what about the catheter? Well, he went home. Everything was okay. On day 35, so we are roughly a month after surgery, he comes back with fever, urosepsis, doesn't feel, and of course, secretion from behind. Surgeon looks at the back because he was very close to the anus, he saw again the fistula, saw that the suture is insufficient, and he said, oh, I should have put more sutures, he said. Whatever, I said, fine with me. But of course, at this point, I said, no way, now I want a colostomy. He didn't want to put it, he wanted to do another suture. So we did colostomy on the patient, and basically sent him home for this down area to heal. On day 66, <laughs> this is a long story, Two months after surgery, we saw that the patient couldn't void well. And he had intermittent retention. We did cystoscopy flexible, very thin. And we saw that the stitch of the anal, transanal closure was in the anastomosis. So I was able, with a small instrument, to cut it and open a little bit the urethra. But just to le learn that a transanal closure, it's very dangerous because you may the anastomosis is right under it. On day 70, we did another anoscopy based on the surgeon's recommendation. No lesion, no pneumaturia. On day 130, now the catheter is still there. We changed it, but it's still there. He still has a lot of urine coming out of the rectum. The catheter was blocked because of clots or whatever. So what would you do now? You still have a fistula. You have a colostomy. So, okay, there is no stool coming out there, but there is urine coming out of the rectum. You know, it's, it's not a story that you want, to, you want to experience in your life. So anyways, um, we did a cystogram, which is normal, and on cystogram, we didn't see a fistula. So the cystogram looked fine to me. So we did an MRI, and on MRI, 
potentially we saw a fistula, a vesico-rectal fistula. And our hypothesis is that probably because of this transanal suture, he kind of like went on also to make the anastomosis a little bit disrupted. And of course, because of the fistula, the healing process of the vesico-uretral anastomosis was bad. So what would you do now? You have a fistula vesico-rectal after radical prostatectomy. It's a disgusting case. What would you do? Okay, but you have to do something. Okay, open what? Splenectomy? What, what do you want to do with him? Abolish the fistula. Yeah, you're, you're, you're Christmas man. It's Christmas time. Let's <laughs> abolish the fistula. It's wonderful. Can you work with us in Vienna? I give you a job. So whenever we have a problem, you say, let's remove the fistula. Well, we tried to do that. It's not that easy, believe me. So uh, what we did, and we made a big concilium, blah, 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 blah. The patient was already a pain in the ass because her husband was a lawyer and blah, blah, blah. It was, it was really, uh, this was a disaster scenario. Uh, again, the stupid surgeon came back. By the way, in the meantime, he was fired for another case. He did a transanal excision of the fistula, but he did well. He did well. And we did from above, we, we did the omental interposition. So we did not go to the anastomosis. Never touch the vesico-urethral anastomosis. If you do it, it's a disaster because the orifices are closed. So if you open that, you have to redo the anastomosis, in which case you probably are going to damage or harm the, the orifices. So don't touch it. Let the surgeons do all the problems. And that's what they do. Let them close the rectum, let them put the omentum, and the bladder will be friendly with us. It's our field. And that's what we did. 